are watching Canadian Muslim News on Muslim Network TV from Toronto, Ontario. I'm Catherine Bullock. Assalamu alaikum and greetings of peace. We hear about the great replacement theory in the media when we when we talk about white supremacists. We will find out what this means when we talk to Dr. Barbara Perry, who is from the Centre on Hate, Bias and Extremism at Ontario Tech University. But first, some news headlines. Canada vows to provide ongoing support to Ukraine at the G7 summit. Doug Ford introduces Ontario's primarily white cabinet. Muslim Fest keeps it, makes a comeback this summer after a two-year break. Israel's army injures 131 Palestinians during protests over settlements. Now the details. Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau has offered unwavering support to Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky against Russia's invasion on Sunday at the 47th G7 summit. The two leaders discussed the financial and military aid required to combat Russian military aggression. Canada's PM also pledged $50 million in aid to prevent Ukrainian grain from spoilage. Trudeau agreed to provide mobile silos to store this year's grain harvest, reducing the threat of global famine. To date, Canada has committed $245 million in humanitarian assistance and up to $620 million in bilateral loans to stabilize the economy. The leaders of the world's most developed economies, known as the G7, have gathered in Germany's Bavarian Alps to discuss dire global issues, such as the Russian invasion of Ukraine, worldwide economic turmoil, and climate change. After a sweeping majority win, Ontario's Premier Doug Ford announced Friday his 30-member cabinet. Despite a few changes, most of the members of the previous tenure remain. Three members have exited the caucus, while seven new members will be joining the cabinet. Critics have noted the new cabinet is male-dominated. Seven of the 30 are women. The new Democratic caucus chair questioned the appointment of Ford's white nephew, Michael Ford, as the Minister of Citizenship and Multiculturalism, noting that there are, quote, people of colour in his cabinet who could have taken that role. North America's most prominent Muslim cultural festival, Muslim Fest, is back in Ontario after being postponed for two years due to COVID restrictions. For the first time, the event will be held at different locations in Ontario from June to September. The family event allows the Muslim community in Canada to come together and develop a sense of identity and community. The festival boasts culture and cuisine through art, music, comedy performance and food, enabling Muslims for various walks of life to bond together. Launched in 2004 by Sound Vision Canada, TorontoMuslims.com and Darwinet, the festival aims to promote Muslim culture and diversity. It attracts around 70,000 Muslims. The Israeli army has injured 131 Palestinians Friday during protests in the northern occupied West Bank. According to a statement by the Palestinian Red Crescent, out of the total injured, 117 suffocated due to tear gas, while live bullets wounded nine. The protests were triggered after Israel's plan to build a 1,000 square meter settlement outpost called Avatar in the vicinity of the occupied land in Jabal Sabah. According to the estimates of both nations, around 650,000 settlers in the West Bank, including occupied Jerusalem, are living in more than 160 settlements. As per international law, any Jewish settlement in or around the occupied land is illegal. And that's it for the news. Several recent tragic mass shootings in the US, Canada and New Zealand over the last few years have been targeting Muslims and other racialized groups with connections to a white supremacist ideology known as the Great Replacement Theory. To unpack its meaning, we welcome to the show Dr. Barbara Perry, Director of the Centre of Hate, Bias and Extremism at Ontario Tech University. Thanks for joining us. Good to see you again. Good to see you too. Great replacement theory is a term that has come out in the media lately. I don't think it was there as much before. Please explain to us what it is. 
Absolutely. I think that it really became uh, most evident to people uh, after the Christchurch murders. That's probably where we really heard it for the first time uh, at the at the very public level. Um, mm. It was something that was in the manifesto. It was something that uh, that that shooter had actually subscribed to for some time. And what it really refers to is, as it suggests, right, the idea that there is some conspiracy to replace white people, white culture, white values, by which they mean white Christian values, by some other set of values and orientations, whether it's with you know, re replacing law with the Sharia law or whether it's replacing white people with black people or brown people. Uh, you know, it varies from from individual and, and group to group. Mm. But really, the essence is that there is this dire threat uh, mm. to the white race that is um, is conscious. It's purposive uh, and it is part of the uh, some grand conspiracy. I've seen some statistics that uh 67% of Republicans in the US and 35% of Democrats. And in Canada, 37% of respondents to a poll, I don't know what the number of people interviewed was, believe that the government is doing this on purpose, bringing in minorities to replace the whites as a way to get votes. Those num numbers are a little bit staggering to me. They really are. And I think that that's a dramatic increase over the past, probably even just the past couple of years, uh, where conspiracy theories have become mainstream. And this is one of those ones, uh, one of those theories, one of those narratives that has been part of that. Uh, you know, it, it really started, I think, you know, some of that started with QAnon at the beginning of Trump, the, the Trump administration. But COVID has really exacerbated the problem. That is, more people are vulnerable to the acceptance, the, uh, you know, taking up those uh, those extreme perspectives, those what what five years ago would have been seen as, uh, you know, sort of untenable and just absurd mm. uh, sets of beliefs. So it really is something uh, fairly recent, I think, in terms of the broad tendency to accept it or at least, you know, lend some credibility to the notion. It resonates with some of the earlier, maybe five years ago, even um, some of the public opinion polling we were seeing around immigration that, uh, you know, large proportions, 35 percent or so were arguing that there was too much uh, non-white uh, immigration into Canada. And this is really an extension of that. And I should add that there's, in some respects, there's nothing new about the replacement theory. It actually has been a part of white supremacist ideology and, and narratives uh, for, you know, a uh, hundred years, uh, at least that, you know, this has always been the threat that that um, white people. Uh, so their conversations about white genocide, for example, that mm. uh, not just that values are being replaced, but that there is some effort to completely exterminate uh, the white race. Uh, so it, it is age old. It's just packaged, repackaged, uh, you know, in, in new clothes, the emperor's new clothes, if you will, uh, in the contemporary era. It's a, a very, um, OK, this is going to sound a bit dumb. I mean, it's like it's very unfortunate, like hu human beings, we're all the same. We have like the same blood, the same, you know, red blood cells and white blood cells. Do, do you know how this idea of there's something like white race? I mean, th these are just constructs, but do you know how people can commit to that and then feel so threatened? Well, I, I mean, what, 200 years, 250 years, 300 years now we've been working or living with this construct of race. Uh, and I mean, the whole I, the whole notion of race, the whole de development of race was a, a colonial practice intended to legitimate, uh, you know, the, the conquering of uh, people in the African continent in particular and, and mm earliest days uh, to legitimate, you know, sort of the, the conquering of those people by white Europeans. Uh, and so that is, it's part of our history. It's part of our culture uh, as, as white people. Uh, and I think that it becomes, you know, when, when there are broader sort of existential threats and uh, economic threats and, you know, a whole array of other things, as we've seen under COVID, right, there's a lot of anxiety, there's a lot mm. of uncertainty. Uh, mm. And so you look for sources of certainty and racial identity is one of those things, right? Mm. The, so the need to preserve that uh, as a constant, as something that we can hold dear, that we can count on, uh, becomes more and more important when there's a crisis. 
I want to ask you a question, but I don't know if I'm going to phrase it well. After 9-11, Muslims were on the defensive, always trying to say that it's not the Quran that caused the violence. It's not the, you know, Islamic faith that causes the violence by, you know, Muslim uh, um, terrorists. Now we see this link between, okay, the white supremacist shooters had this ideology, great replacement theory ideology, and then they go and commit these mass shootings, which makes a connection between the idea and the act that I think Muslims have spent a lot of time trying to complicate. Uh, are you able to just give I, some I comment so. on that? Yeah, I think you're you're highlighting for me what what the great irony is, right? Those data. Um, those statistics that you just uh, shared, right, suggest that there actually is a large proportion of, at least in Canada and the U.S., uh, the white population that, that that supports what seems to be an extremist ideology, mm. uh, you know, and, and yet, you know, because of a very small proportion of Muslims who may subscribe to some extremist ideology, we paint the whole community, the whole culture uh, as a suspect, yet when it's a white issue. So if we think back to the Oklahoma City bombing, for example, mm. uh, what was that, 30 or whoa, 40 years ago, uh, you know, the there was no claim that, you know, this white Christian spoke for all, uh, you know, all white Christians or all mm. white Americans for that matter. And yet now we see that perhaps, you know, these extremists uh, in some respects do speak for a large proportion of the population. So I think that's the, that's the real irony. That's the real disconnect, I think, in our thinking. That's an important point that you've made. What about the is, the, is there really such a straight line between idea and violent act? There, there can be. I mean, you know, think about how many, you know, 47%, 50%, whatever numbers we're talking about, Clearly, not that many people uh, are going to engage in violence. But as we've seen in Quebec City, as we've seen in London, Ontario, uh, as we've seen in downtown uh, downtown Toronto, uh, it, it really only takes one to wreak havoc, uh, as we saw, obviously, Christchurch uh, as well, and, and so mm. many shootings in the U.S. Mm. Uh, so the, the, it, there is no doubt whatsoever. And by their own words, many of those shooters were, in fact, very much informed and mobilized by what they're consuming online. Line. These exactly these sorts of narratives. Uh, so I don't think that we have to, you know, think we don't have to worry. We don't all, only have to be concerned about, uh, you know, sort of the fact that, you know, hundreds of people, thousands of people are going to act on that. We need to be concerned at the very root that even if a dozen people uh, mm. act on those sorts of narratives, it wreaks mm. havoc, it destroys lives, it destroys communities. That's so true. And that's the true whoever's behind the, the shooting or the bombing, be it Muslim or, or, or white supremacist. Absolutely. What can we do? How, how can we share the idea that we're all human beings from the same family and try to create bonds of friendship and love instead of this idea of polarization? Yeah, and, and certainly the, that's the sort of work that we've, we've all been doing for the past uh, decade and certainly uh, in particular the last five years or so where we've seen this resurgence in the far right. And I think that there's no silver bullet here. There's no magic uh, magic answer. I think that it is multi-sectoral, it's multi-dimensional, that uh, you know, our, our formal education systems need to be involved, our media need to be involved in terms of the messaging. Uh, you know, I think that in the last few years, the media have done a very good job about highlighting the risk associated with these narratives. They've done a good job of highlighting uh, the far right and, and their activities. I, I think what they haven't done quite so well is unpack those narratives mm -hmm. uh, and sort of provide the, the counter evidence. Now, the challenge, of course, is that some of those same polls or you know, polls done by organization, the same organizations are also find, finding that there's a lack of trust in media. So that, you know, obviously can't rely. There's a lack of trust in government. Uh, so we can't obviously rely on government intervention uh, either. So I think that, you know, not-for-profit uh, community-based organizations have a, a really significant role to play here, I think, in terms of developing local programs as well as, as national programs. Um, you know, sort of these kinds of interfaith dialogues that we're seeing uh, all over. Um, and, you know, other sorts of uh, uh, interventions that will draw people together uh, and that highlight the, the gaps in some of those narratives. Well, unfortunately, we're out of time, but thank you again for your expertise and insights. Thanks for joining us. Okay, good to see you again. Thank you for watching Canadian Muslim News. If you like what we do, please share, like, and subscribe. Stay safe and God bless.